you talking about? I'm a good dancer. Well, welcome back to the telethon. Uh, yeah, we're uh, we're uh, still here, and um, we're now we're uh, we talked about uh, a lot of things so far. We talked about uh, life, and we talked about death, and now we're going to talk about grief. This is the grief segment, and uh, you know I've I've lost a lot of people in my life. I can tell you that, and, I, and uh, they've given me the uh, the stages of grief here, and uh, I can tell you I know all about them. I visited many stages of grief, and they're all at the strip club. <laughs> Why don't you just leave it on, like? I'm just, uh, just, yeah, I just try to unwind and then I get all tied up again and it, it, you can't even, uh, you can't even, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm here for it, man. Joe, I'm here, man. 24 hours, buddy. Let's keep it going. My eye is killing me. They won't give me any, uh, sort of, uh, generic, uh, ibuprofen or um, even like a, even like a you know like a uh, like a nice stiff drink would be good like but I, I know we're uh, I got uh, abstinence base right I'm all about harm reduction so if I could just get like you know a couple fingers of something <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I lost a lot of people in my life okay and I, I'll tell you right now the goal is to just get over it. That's what you want to do. This stuff is, uh, you know, like, you, you just want to bury that uh, deep inside you and uh, put it in a big steel vault and just lock the vault, right? And then try not to think about it, right? It's like cold turkey or diarrhea or something. You, it just gets a little bit better every day until it goes away, okay? This stuff is, I mean, it may work for some people and it may be... Uh, evidence-based uh, but for me uh, I like to just uh, suppress it and uh, keep it in a uh, tight uh, like the inside of a golf ball just a tight inner wound series of elastic bands that are too tight to break they're just they, they they're just there forever that's me uh, some women dress in black and bake each other casseroles I don't I suppose that's a nice thing to do. Uh, goes with the mourning uh, aspect of the grieving process and a uh, deep dish of warm food cooked with love is a comforting offering. So that's a good thing to do uh, for anyone. Um, you want to go through these stages uh, properly and, and uh, deal with your grief correctly. Um, you will develop uh, peptic ulcers if you don't. I can uh, attest to that. Um, but I'm sh pretty sure um, the experts are going to agree with me that uh, the vault is the way to go. Um, you just want to bury it deep inside like a pressure cooker kind of crock pot powder keg situation and hope that it doesn't explode when you're uh, in line at the Timmy's and <laughs> somebody's changing uh you know every menu item into a special order and it's been 40 minutes and you've got you know a soap opera or something you want to watch in your neighbor's uh big screen tv and um you get out of your car and uh You yell at an old lady or something like that. I, uh, I feel bad about that. That uh, hypothetical situation I was just referring to was actually a real-life scenario from uh, my own uh, not-too-distant past. I have uh, anger management issues. Um, that's on the record. Um, not proud of uh, much of anything I've uh, done uh, with my life, but um, it certainly was not old lady's fault. And the courts have proven that. And um, we just have to let it go. It gets better. It gets better. 
900 hours of community service is 600 hours is 300 hours is 200 hours is you slept in you didn't make it and you have to do the rest of the time on weekends in jail but you live to tell the tale you get up and you go and um that's that's what it's i think all about is um life is for the living so uh honor honor them uh with uh your uh actions let's hear about grief I'd like to say hello to everybody, Bojo, Tansei. I'm glad that everybody was able to show up here. Uh, and we give thanks to the people living in the park here right now for allowing us to be here in this space. And we honor them. And then we honor the people that were in this park and they're not here anymore. And so with that, we're going to do an opening song. And we have Isaiah once again. He's going to come in and sing with us. And uh, we're going to wait one second. Everybody uh, can... This just shows another reason why we need to have this stuff here and be witness to what's happening here. And I give thanks for everybody to be, you know, calm and safe and, you know, being supportive. That's really important. And so what we're going to do now, we're going to do an opening song. And we always want to do that, in like, in a special way to make sure we do these things in the proper way. And we're very lucky we have some great singers, some great dancers, and some great people yourself be here. My name is Isaiah Keda. I'm Ojibwe from uh, Mississauga and Blind River, but I'm born and raised here in Toronto, Ontario. <laughs> Which is called Odewe Gun. It's uh, like the heartbeat of our nation, right? So um, when I was when I was young, I was taught about it. Uh, it's it's in our blood, the the sound, because we hear that that sound for for nine months. That boomf, 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 right? So it's it's in us. So when we're when we're born, to hear that sound, it, it soothes us. My daughter, when when she was young, I I, I held her on one of those carriers and then we'd uh we'd sing there'd be like seven guys around sit, sitting around a big drum singing right and she'd be passed out right there so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so that 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 sound it, it it soothes us right instead of some most people think oh it's loud it's it's this this 
but that sound it's, it's like a calling it, it, it's in our blood it's in, it's in it's inside of us that sound there's a lot of things going on in the world and even things really close by us right now it's really confusing and hard to understand and some of it's not hard to understand it's just wrong and we got to realize that that why we're here how come we're here and together we'll come up with those with those actions that need to be done like stuff my my they've come almost you know someone that like i see as a mentor nook you know doing the stuff you know on their own what they want to do by the way Nobody telling them what they have to do. As Nishnabi Health did the same thing with the COVID van. They weren't wait, waiting for the city. If we waited for the city, we still wouldn't have that COVID van being out. But we have that now. And we have tested almost every encampment in Toronto. And again, not one person has tested positive. Because they, they take care of each other and the people like yes and, and other people like you know, have feasts and take care of them and get food and that's such an important thing so i want you to think about those people that we've lost and that you've lost and and pray and, and give thanks give thanks that you got to meet them you got to walk the service with them i lost my father two years ago and i always just say i feel grateful that i got to walk this earth was my father. We had footsteps together. We got to walk. I got to learn from him so many things. It's such an important thing. You've taken a lot of time out of your, your own personal life from the people you've lost the past while. That grief, that not having been able to have that space to share, to grieve. And that's something that we need to do. We, we, we can't carry that stuff. We can't carry that stuff with, with ourselves. We need to let that go. And that's why we smudge and pray and dance, is to have our mind, body, and spirit be clear as possible and learn how to be in that space of each other. So it's really important that we do that. Um, especially for talking about our singers in that way, I really, a lot of the times I know a lot of you see us in our regalia and we get a lot of visual, that visual attention, right? Um, so I love it that when our traditional people actually honor our singers because we wouldn't make regalias if it wasn't for the singers. There's no drum, there's no voice, there wouldn't be us. So I think give thanks for that. So the story that I know of the fancy shawl, there is a few, but the one that I was gifted, I was able to sit with one of our amazing storytellers, Melvin John from Kehuen First Nation. And uh, we used to go out for the VSPs. He lived here in Toronto for a little while. The Native Canadian Center, we used to go out. I know Sharon's come out with us, all of us. We've gone out and did uh, cultural teachings all over the city. And Melvin would share this story of the fancy shawl. And as he was re getting ready to go back home, I said to him, well, Melvin, do you think that I could like maybe make you a gift off use of tobacco? But tobacco can't be, it has to be something big, you know? So I could learn this story from you so I could share that. And he says, well, what do you think you've been doing all this time? <laughs> he says, so just make sure you honor me and my family and where the story came from. So there was a time, as all of you know, where our dances were outlawed. Years back in the early 1900s, them over there would be here for us in our regalia. If more than two native people gathered at once, it was illegal. It was illegal for us to wear our feathers that are gifts for what we do within our community. We wouldn't be allowed to wear regalia. Isaiah wouldn't be allowed to sing. And you think about that and see that resistance. So you see when, you know, Les talked about 
you know, where that living proof, it really is. So our traditional people, are, you know, they hid all of the dances, all of that away. And there was a time where Buffalo Bill Cody in the early 1920s started having that Wild Wild West show. And all of us knew Sitting Bull from that time, he used to go out into that Wild Wild West. And then there was, um, our dances started coming out. So some of our first dances that came back to us was, in, was showcased in that Wild Wild West show. And then in the early 1930s, there was an uh, evolution from our men's fancy, I mean, traditional dance to our men's fancy dance. And a lot of you have seen that men's fancy dance. It's very fast, very beautiful. The drum beats picked up, and so that um, dance got faster. And there used to be a young girl who saw that style of dance. She loved it, you know, but with colonization came the gender binary, which is not traditional to a lot of our nations. Well, from my understanding, all our nations, but I couldn't. So with that kind of coming in was that men's and women's dance when it came to now us coming back in that, around that time. So a young girl saw that style of dance and said, no, I'm not following rules. I'm going to disguise. I'm going to put on that, that regalia and I'm going to dance. And because of that bravery, she changed things. And you know, and we talk about what, when you watch us dance, you will see that butterfly. It's also called that butterfly dance. And that's, they teach us that transformation and how things change. You think about that caterpillar, then it goes within to be in that chrysalis and then is birthed into that beautiful butterfly. And it goes on to pollinate and share its beauty with everyone. And that's what that young lady did. So we had our traditional um, dancers our, that had their shawls on their arms. So after she, it was found that that was a young lady, not a young man, we honored her with that bravery by taking our shawls off of our back and beginning our li lift our feet off of Mother Earth and then birthed our, our fancy dance. And then also too, it also changed that, that thing because now we have our non-binary in our community who has our own two-spirited powers, right? Like, look at that. So even in that, in that beauty, in that, we can't even see what that change has brought and we won't see what is to come. So I give much thanks for that. You guys. I'm gonna dance with, this is my daughter Nazarene. I started dancing because of Naz. She was just little and she would run up to people and try and touch their regalia. So I made her a sh fancy shawl and then I started to dance with her. So she's my inspiration. Be good. So today, think about those people that that we've lost and think about them in a good way and pray for them and think of them that they are on a different journey now. In, in our culture, this is just one journey. There's another journey we have. A lot of times, the suffering is us down here. That, that's where it is. They're not suffering. They're in their spirit world with, with the great spirit. And that is an important thing for us to know that that's where they are. They're being, they're being taken care of. We're, we're sitting there, we're smudging. We're praying for them. We're feeding them. We're doing ceremony for them. We're making sure they're okay. As much as they're doing the same thing for us. That's the thing to remember. And that's why we do this, these ceremonies and practices. That's why it's so important for us to, to do this.
Psych2Go is a digital media organization that raises mental health awareness by presenting psychological topics in a digestible and relatable manner. Please share our content with those who need it. It's a great way to show your support to us as well. Most people know the common five to seven stages of grief. Shock, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, testing, and acceptance. Everyone experiences these stages in entirely different ways. While you're grieving, many people will tell you something along the lines of, stay strong, or it'll get better. While those are predictable and well-intentioned things to say in an attempt to comfort someone, they're not always true. When I was younger, I experienced more than my fair share of grief. And after years of reflection, I've come to understand that there is more to grieving than most people realize. I would like to share with you five things about grieving that I desperately wish someone would have shared with me. One, we grieve for more than the dead. Yes, the death of a human being is the most common source of grief, but it's not the only one. You can experience the whole force of grief for anything important to you. You can grieve the loss of a pet. You can mourn the loss of a sentimental object, the loss of a beloved place, or of any kind of relationship or connection. Nothing has to die in order for you to go into mourning. There can be grief for a friendship that has just drifted apart, or for the ending of your favorite book series, a home that you've had to move away from. You can grieve for yourself. When you grow and change as a person, pieces can be left behind. Old bits of a personality and mannerisms that we can ache for all the same. Whenever something is lost, no matter what, no matter why, and it causes pain in its absence, that is grief. Two, just stay strong typically goes hand in hand with the denial phase of grief. It's when you're told that despite all the terrible things happening to you, you must stay strong and overcome it. What is not said is that just stay strong should mean when you're done properly grieving, you will still be alive. This will not kill you. You are stronger than your tragedy. Instead of pretend like nothing's wrong, don't let your tragedy affect you. Just keep living regardless. Denial is usually said to be the first or second stage of grief. If you find yourself stuck there, you will never eventually get to acceptance and you will never really be out of your cycle of grief. It's okay to not be strong. That's what people should tell you when you're beginning to grieve. It's all right to cry, to scream, to take time away. It's understandable to feel weak for a bit, so long as you learn to let that weakness go. You do not have to stay strong. If you do, moving on may become difficult. Weakness and vulnerability is part of the grieving process, and it should be accepted. Three, there should be a guilt phase of grief. Often when we lose something, those of us that are still here feel a sense of guilt. Some people feel left behind. Some feel survivor's guilt, in which they believe they should also be gone or should have died in the other's place. Some simply regret what they missed out on before the end. They regret something they said or did or the lack thereof. We find a way to place the blame on ourselves, find a way to make circumstances our fault, even when it's not. Facing death often precedes a reevaluation of life. It's only natural that we question things in our time of grief. It's normal to find regrets. You're always going to feel like you could have done something. You're not weird or unhealthy to feel a sense of guilt, but you need to learn to let it go eventually. There's nothing to gain from holding on to it. Instead, turn that guilt into nutriment for what is still alive. Learn from your regrets and use them as a guide to ensure that you live the life you have to the fullest. Four, time means little to the act of grieving. It does not heal all wounds, but merely smooths them over, making it easier to forget their presence. It'll get better is nice, though not necessarily true. And that's okay. There are some things that'll never really go away. Some scars never fade, but that's a fact of life and part of you. It's normal to still be haunted by things that happened long ago, to still grieve years later. Do not be down on yourself for being emotionally caught up in the past sometimes. You can't just ignore trauma and tragedy and hope that it'll go away. Nothing fixes itself. To heal requires treatment, 
whether that be through outside assistance or internal reflection. Acceptance will not just roll around to you. You have to get there yourself. Five, acceptance is more complicated than just admitting to a loss. Acceptance is not a finish line. There is no real finish line with grieving because grief is not a marathon. Rather than a straight shot to the end, it's a winding and confusing maze. Nor is it a one and done thing. More than likely, you will find yourself going through the cycle of grief several times throughout your life. And chances are, you will grieve the same thing more than once. You can regress, and that's perfectly okay. You could be done with grieving for years when suddenly something triggers you and you have to go through it all over again. This usually happens if you did not let yourself grieve properly the first time, but it can still happen to those that have had the proper closure. We're never really done with grieving. We will grieve for as long as we live. The cycle of grief goes hand in hand with the cycle of life, but that is nothing to be afraid of. In order to accept our losses, we must accept the cycle of grief for all that it is. We hope you enjoyed this video. And if you're grieving, we hope that you fully allow yourself to do so. Or maybe you know someone who's grieving. Share this video with them. As always, thanks for watching. In spite of what the graduation speakers say every spring, our town's pretty average. It goes for our seats, too. Out of this class of 40, just because it is average, two of these boys and girls will spend some part of their lives in a mental institution. My job is to try to keep the people around here healthy, and most of them are. Of course, nobody's health is ever perfect. Jim Anderson has a bad ear. That doesn't keep him from playing on the football team. County champions last year, too. Frank White is nearsighted, but his glasses take care of that. Dorothy Westerly has a tooth that needs fixing, but she's in good health, I'd say. Mighty good health. They've all learned habits of good living that have helped them stay physically healthy. Habits of cleanliness, good diet, exercise, and rest. But there's another side to good health, and that's good mental health. It comes naturally to most people. Parents who are mentally healthy bring up the children to be mentally healthy, too. Take Tommy Clark there. He learned the first rule for good mental health a long time ago, about not bottling up his emotions. Now, when he works up a head of steam, he puts it to work in a useful way, instead of holding it inside. When you try to do that, it's bound to come out in some unpleasant way. Tommy learned that some years back, just after his younger brother was born. Come on, Jimmy, have some, come on. Tommy, eat your meat. You haven't eaten a bite all day. I declare, I don't know what's got into you. You heard your mother, Thomas. Now do as she says. Finally, his folks sent him to see me. There wasn't anything physically wrong with him that I could find, so I began to talk with him. If you've got something on your mind, Tommy, why don't you talk about it? Well, well, I... Uh, we all have our problems, Tommy. But I can talk about it. Of course you can. And you know something? The more you talk about your problems, the easier they are to solve. It's uh, bottling things up inside that's bad. When you feel something, if you're mad or afraid or worried, you've got to let it out or it'll come out some other way. Like you losing weight, not sleeping. Now, what is it, son? Gosh, Dr. Martinson, this may sound kind of funny to you. No, no, it won't. I don't think my folks want me anymore. They're planning to get rid of me. 
What makes you think that, sir? I heard them say so one night. They thought I was asleep. Ever since Jimmy was born, they... Uh, <laughs> well, it wasn't easy to prove to Tommy that he was wrong. As in so many cases like this, his parents were partly to blame. The new baby was taking more of their attention than they realized. They got a chance to talk to Tommy's mother about it, and it turned out that they'd been talking about sending Tommy to camp for the summer, and he'd misunderstood them. Well, we finally got it straightened out. But it taught Tommy a lesson that many people don't learn so quickly about not bottling up his emotion. He learned that it could be easy to talk to his folks and that he didn't have to hide his love for them. Good night, Mom. Good night, Tommy. Well, that is quite a few years ago. Tom's graduating today. That number one rule for good mental health, don't bottle up your emotions, has helped him through many a tough spot. Of course, we're talking about some of the simple rules for staying in good mental health. And that brings us to the second rule, which is respecting yourself. Sounds easy, doesn't it? But look what happened to Bruce Matthews. He went out for the tennis team a couple of years ago, and while he had a lot to learn, he had the makings of a fine player. But he wasn't satisfied with slow, steady improvement. <laughs> oh. He expected himself to be perfect right from the start. Missing a point would make him boil over at himself. Well, the coach finally caught on to what Bruce was doing to himself with his demand for perfection. Sure, I think it's fine to keep wanting to improve. I understand that, but I think you're going at it the wrong way. How do you mean? Well, did you ever stop to think how good your game really is? Yeah, after missing that last point? That's just what I'm getting at. You're worrying too much about the game, and you don't enjoy it. But, gee, Coach, I know I can do better. Sure you can. But the point is, you shouldn't let yourself get mad every time you miss a point. Why, even the world's champion can't make every point. You can't be perfect. You've got to learn to get more pleasure out of this game. So take yourself as you are, and instead of expecting yourself to be perfect. It took a while for Bruce to get what the coach was driving at. But, little by little, Without letting up one bit on trying to improve his game, he learned to enjoy his skill rather than fret over his occasional misses. Yes, he's learning that second important habit for keeping in good health. Good mental health, I mean. The habit of feeling right about himself. Along with that goes a third important habit. Feeling right about other people, too. That means getting along with others, having fun with them, being part of the group. There's no room for bashfulness in good mental health. To look at Otto Markle there, you'd never guess what he was like a year ago. For some reason or other, he was convinced that people just didn't like him much. He never tried to make friends or to be one of the bunch. It was Miss Reiner who came to Otto's rescue. I think you'd enjoy getting into one of the school clubs. I don't know. I really don't have any time. I hear they're planning to organize a camera club. You could help with that. I'm not very good with my camera. I don't think they'd want me in the club. Of course they would. The more the better when you're organizing a club. Gosh, Miss Reiner. You're certainly doing well in chemistry. And that's important in photography. I don't know. Chemistry's different from photography. I think you'll find they'd welcome a good chemist like you in the camera club. But you'll have to do one thing. What's that? Offer to help. Do all you can to help get the club organized. Get some other students to join. Oh, I couldn't do that. Of course you can. And you'll find that they'll like you as much as you like them. I knew about Otto's problem because his parents had come to see me about the same thing. Of course, they had to share the responsibility for Otto's bashfulness. What do you mean, George? I don't quite get what you're driving at. No? Well, I'll tell you, Art. I've been watching you with that kid a long time. You're demanding too much from him. Nobody can be perfect, so don't ride him so hard. When he does something you don't like, remember he's a person in his own right. His way may be just as good as your way. I do think you've been hard on him at times, Arthur. Oh, but he doesn't toe the line the way he should. 
He has advantages I never had when I was a boy. He has an opportunity to amount to something. But let him do it his own way. You've got him feeling now he isn't as good as the next fella. That's why he hesitates to make friends. In all those cases, as in many others I've known, talking with the parents was important in helping to get things straightened out. He's learning the third basic rule for good mental health, feeling right about other people. That means that in any normal group of people, there is a feeling of give and take. There's an interest in the group as a whole. There's no distrust or dislike of others just because they happen to be different. Well, there's one more rule for good mental health. And I see that Nancy's finally learned it well enough to get her diploma. That's the habit of doing something about a problem as soon as it comes up. Gosh, what I don't know about the Civil War period. I haven't cracked a page in two weeks. I'm going to have to dig into this one, too. Come on over to my house tonight. Let's study it together. Oh, I just dread getting into it. Let's put it off till tomorrow. Well, all right. Tomorrow never came for Nancy. That quiz day found her completely unprepared. But Barbara had faced up to that quiz the day it was announced. Oh, Jay, I've been so worried about this exam. I, I just can't sleep. Oh, I hope I pass. There's no point in worrying about it now. Nancy not only had double trouble with that quiz, she had triple trouble, before, during, and after. She'd got busy just as soon as it was announced, instead of just worrying about it, it would have been a lot easier for her. Yes, the people around here are learning some of the basic rules for staying in good mental health. First rule is, don't bottle up your emotions like love, fear, anger. Express them naturally, of course. Emotions like anger have to be expressed with consideration for others. Above all, don't carry a grudge. Get it off your chest. The second rule is to respect your own abilities. Always try to improve, but remember that you're human. The third rule is to respect others. Treat them as friends. And finally, when a problem shows up, Face it at once, calmly, reasonably, and honestly. And remember that one of the best rules for good mental health is talking out your troubles and problems with someone whose opinion you respect. Your parents, your family doctor, your school teacher or advisor. Your clergyman may be the right person to talk to on many things. Whoever it may be, talking is one of the best tonics there is for good mental health. Another good tonic is an interesting hobby. It gives you a way to relax, a chance to accomplish something you can be proud of. Well, those are some of the rules for staying in good mental health. Of course, they're just the ABCs of a subject big enough to fill whole library. Oftentimes, we imagine grief during the time of death. And of course, that's probably the most prominent or the most dramatic one. But grief happens all the time. We're, we're losing things all the time. And I'm not talking about your keys. <laughs> I'm talking about a loss of a job. I'm talking about the loss of a lifestyle. As an example, something is, that could be celebrated can still cause grief. Your children grow up and move off to university and all of a sudden there's an emptiness, there's that void in your life. And there's a bit of grieving that happens with that. You move on to a new job, but you can still be grieving the old job or your old colleagues, friends that you knew. Uh, you move to a new home and you love your new home, but perhaps you've had to leave behind the home where your children grew up or where you grew up. And so there's a grief. I remember when we sold our home in Oakville, my daughter still to this day cannot drive by that street because it reminds her that her mom and dad don't live in that house anymore. And that is truly a form of grief. And so being open to people's emptiness, I think, is what we can do to help them. When I am counseling people, 
often um, during times of grief after losing a loved one or a family member, but sometimes even after a divorce or a separation, which caused, even though it might be good health-wise, there's still a grieving that happens, a grieving of what could have been. Um, when, I, when I'm doing that, you know, I, I remind folks that grief is individual, that there's no one way to grieve. I think we've been, especially those of us who are in the helping professions, have been taught, you know, um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book about the seven stages of grief and that this is how you go through grief, stage one, stage two, stage three, and it makes it seem like it's linear. I don't believe that. In my experience, it is not linear. People approach the stages, if there even are seven stages, but they approach the stages differently. And they go back and they go forward. To me, it's more like a spiral, you know, me and my spirals. <laughs> it's, it's more like you just continue to go through it and come back to a, with a different level of understanding. When I experience times with my uh, folk, talking to them about grief, it seems to me like the analogy of a wave seems to be a little more accurate, where you can be doing just fine and the water is calm and the water is serene, but then all of a sudden a wave appears and you go under. And you come back up and the water clears and then the wave comes back. And so it goes back and forth. The other thing that I think our society has taught us, and I think it came back from years ago when, you know, someone in your family died, you got three days of bereavement time. So in three days, you should be over it. Well, that's hogwash. <laughs> There's no time around grief. There's no time. Some people grieve and seemingly get over it. Some people, it takes a lot longer. And that's not bad. And that's not good. It's just individual. And so when we're dealing with people who are in the process of grieving, and it is a process, it's not, it's not a one-time event, it's a process. When we're dealing with people who are grieving, I think it's important for us to just listen. You know, I always tell my, my kids, God gave you two ears and one mouth, so you listen twice as much as you speak. And I think that that's the most important thing we can do is to listen, to be present to them. We don't have to have the right words to say, because really there's probably not the right words to say. There are some wrong things to say. One of the most dangerous things I think us religious folk can say, and I hear it all the time, and it's meant from a good place. It's meant because you want to say something. But I'll hear people say, well, God won't give you any more than you can handle. That doesn't help. You know, um, that, you know, just turn to God and all will be well. That doesn't help. Well, he's in a better place. That doesn't help. God needed another angel. That didn't help. What does help is to sit, to let someone cry, to let someone share their memories, and then to thank them for their openness. Really, that's all. I don't think it's any more difficult than that. And it is as difficult as that. Help! Help! I'm, I'm stuck. I, I think I'm bleeding. Come on to help! Uh, okay, Keep okay, talking. follow my voice. Keep talking, follow your voice. I have one question though. I am, I am. What is it? Do you have a minute to talk about our Lord and Savior? Come on, buddy. I need you to keep talking. Also, I have some literature. Uh, is anyone else out there? If anyone else is out there, don't worry. I've got this. Don't come. No, please worry. Come. No, and only come if you want to see the light of the Lord. Or if you just want to save someone. Oh. I will save you, don't worry. No, no, it, it's fine. I, I, I'm free. No, thanks for your help. No need to come Great. save me. We just have to talk about the good word. God is uh, good. No, don't do that. Just anyone else, come please. You appear to still be trapped, brother. 
Let me save you, and then I shall save you. Do you have, like, first aid? Because internally, there's some bad stuff happening. Something even better. The Holy Bible. Father, Stop. Stop. Stop that. Stop! I'm... I'm not religious, and I don't want to be... Just help me. I'm trying to save you. If you go out there and continue to lead your hedonistic lifestyle, what have I actually done? No. I'm going to save you. God has left me your only hope, and I'm going to save you. God, I heard the yelling. <laughs> We have to lift this log. Quick, get on the other side. Before you do that, do you have a minute to talk about our Lord and Savior? No, I do not. Thank you. I, I feel like I've been being the asshole here, but there's no way I can be the asshole. Because I have a lifetime to talk about our Lord and Savior. No, an eternal life. Praise be. Our Father who art in heaven, lift hallowed be thy name. The log first? Look. We're trying as hard as we can. We're doing everything we could possibly be doing to save you. We're saving you as fast as possible. Hail Mary, full of it just really hurts. Did you hear that? Someone else is in need of our saving. Let us go, brother. Quick, our real practical help. Guys, can you lift the log first? Guys? Guys? Whether it's the loss of a relationship, a friendship, or a loved one, grieving is never easy. However, it's always part of the process. Psych2Go's mission is to make psychology and self-care topics more accessible to everyone. We may think we've already moved on from something or someone, but that may not always be the case. In today's video, we'll be discussing the unexpected signs that you're still grieving. If you have experienced significant loss, but a long time has passed and you still experience some of the following symptoms, you may be experiencing complicated grief, also known as unresolved grief. Research shows that emotional pain activates the same regions of the brain as physical pain, so it's important not to take these symptoms lightly. Okay, let's start the video. One, your chest might feel tight, painful, or sinking into your stomach. A physical symptom of grief is an increase in blood pressure. It also increases the risk of blood clots. According to Harvard Health Publishing, intense grief can alter the heart muscles so much it can even cause broken heart syndrome, also known as stress-induced cardiomyopathy. The main symptoms are chest pain and shortness of breath, as if one were experiencing a heart attack. Experts think that surging stress hormones can essentially stun the heart preventing the left ventricle from contracting effectively. This occurs more often in women than men. Two, you may be extremely focused on reminders of your loss or be excessively avoidant towards them. While these are opposite behaviors, obsessing over details and reminders or avoiding them excessively may be signs that you're still grieving. It's normal to feel pain upon being reminded of your loss, but if you find yourself constantly focused on reminders, it may be hard to move through the grieving stages. But why is constantly avoiding reminders also problematic? Do you find yourself pushing away painful or uncomfortable memories when you're reminded of them? Excessive avoidance can have long-term health consequences. Efforts to avoid the reality of loss demand energy and block the natural abilities of the body and mind to heal. Research by Strobe and others shows that avoidance makes depression, complicated grief, and the physical health problems associated with them more likely to occur. Three, you feel like you're getting sick more easily or taking longer to recover from your sicknesses. Grief increases inflammation and disrupts the immune system. This means that it can worsen existing health problems or cause new ones and leave you vulnerable to infection. Essentially, grief causes you stress not only on an emotional level, but on a physical level too. It can leave you feeling fatigued, and can give you headaches, stomach pain, nausea, and less appetite too. And four, you're still showing signs of stress. 
your body may be showing you signs of stress, even if you may not realize it. Adding on to the previous point, feeling uncomfortable physical symptoms and recovering slower from illnesses are signs of stress. Are you experiencing a range of unpleasant feelings? Do you have cravings to misuse substances more than normal? You may be showing residue signs from stress. If you wanna know more about stress, check out our video, Six Signs of Stress You Shouldn't Ignore for more details on signs of stress. Are you grieving? If so, how are you handling it? Also, if you know someone who may benefit from online counseling, we've actually partnered up with BetterHelp. It's an affordable online counseling platform that you could utilize. They're constantly striving to improve their services and terms and conditions. And the link will be in the description box below. I think when we're talking, like, I've been thinking a lot actually lately about like the overdose crisis and like why so many people are dying and like why people you like use drugs in particular ways. And I know for myself when I was younger, like the ways in which I like used like more chaotically came from loss, losing people, like really significant loss, other types of loss. And then it's like something we don't talk about how loss like impacts our lives. Like it impacts our health, it impacts our bodies, it impacts the way we relate to people. It impacts like, it impacts so much. Like I think we're, we're gonna have generations of people that are just coping and dealing with this amount of loss. For some of us, we come from communities that have experienced more overdose death than others. So it's not, un, it's not like lots of my friends have lost many friends and family members. It's not like they've just lost one person. That kind of loss is so heavy. It's like super hard to deal with. You know, of course people might like get more fucked up to deal with that or they might find other ways to deal with that. <clears throat> but there isn't actually any really good help for you. You know, like it's, I went into a lot of the work I, I got into doing harm reduction was around loss. It was around grief. It was around wanting to change systems so that people could thrive. Like I didn't even get into harm reduction so that you just could keep somebody alive. And then, then what? And like the, you know, I really struggle around the overdose crisis because I started in harm reduction when we were like building programs, like hep C was the thing we were worried about. Like, it was like, oh yeah, we want to make people's lives better. Like, and then now it's just like, oh, we want you to not die. And we don't have all the resources we can have to help you. And that kind of like, so violent that we just can't, we can't just like offer the solutions we know what will work. So on top of like, dealing with that kind of violence, like state violence, structural violence, you also live, live with the grief of the loss. And that can just impact us, well, impact, it's has impacted me super negatively. It's affected my relationships, it's affected the way that I operate day to day, it's made me end up at Cam H when I was dealing with so much loss that I couldn't, I just one day felt like I wasn't here anymore. Um, it, it's really hard to get therapy like I probably spent thousands I have spent thousands and thousands of dollars going to therapy mostly around my job a lot to do with loss and then that we don't even have benefits for that so we don't get coverage for that there isn't like those people like a lot of us who do this work are people from who have experience so <laughs> It's wild to me that we're, you know, the, the workforce is as expendable as the people we work with and that there isn't been more of an attention paid to the kind of suffering that people are going through, the amount of grief that happens. And then when we lose people, like, I remember days at work where Pops, who we organized Moss Park with, overdosed and died. His son came to Moss Park, told us the shift was about to start. It's like, here's my friend who's fucking died and I have to work. Not only do I have to work, but I have to run a whole shift in an overdose crisis. And we had six overdoses that day at work to attend to. And we also were all dealing with the grief of losing our friend and our coworker and our co-organizer. And, and that, you know, you don't get a break. There is no relief to that. You can't just be like, see you guys, like, I'm not going to work today because I'm so fucking upset. I can't function. It's like, no, I have to compartmentalize this so I can continue to go on because people need me or are relying on me. 
And I think that for me has, that's been really, that's really hard. It's been really, really hard. And I have also used grief to organize. I take, because I'm like, I'm not going to let the people I love and care about, like they're not, their deaths, like our political deaths. And in, in honor of those people, I'm going to fight like fucking hell. Like I want us to fight like hell. I want to fight like hell so people don't die. And I want us to fight like hell so we can truly honor the people that we cared about because I like, it's just one of the most, it's just a massive injustice that we have all the tools and solutions, but it just continues and it'll, it'll keep continuing. Like one day I'll feel okay. And then like the next week someone else dies. And it's not just like they just die. It's like their deaths are disenfranchised. Like our grief is disenfranchised. Their deaths are like sudden and I think there's no and then during COVID like we don't even talk, we can't meet like it's hard to go to funerals it's been I went to a funeral of one of my mentors and peers who died she did not overdose but she passed away and like just watching it online was just so fucked up like not even being able to come together to grieve together has been really hard and then you know there's like grief I have for people I don't even know. Like I have grief around the amount of hundreds of unclaimed bodies in the province of Ontario that sat at the morgue or are buried in boxes by Highway 7. I grieve for those deaths. I think about those people dying. I think about their families and friends not knowing. I think about whether I know someone there. Like I, 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 I know someone whose family didn't come to get them. And I used, used to have like at work we would do a lot of memorials we would go get people's bodies and claim them when their families didn't and like I hold on to that grief definitely and it's it's really painful there were times in my life where I was gonna call the veterans hotline when I wasn't doing well or like there was a time where my grief was so bad I had to go home to the Yukon and be at my mom's house out in the bush because I just I couldn't handle how bad I felt um and of course we feel bad because it's not numbers, it's people. It's people that we know, it's people we love and care about, it's people we support in our jobs. Like I've worked in the same neighborhood for almost 20 years. I've known people for a really long time. I'll know their family members. It's like, it's not, yeah, it's, it's heavy. And we're gonna lose a whole workforce. We already are. There's lots of people stepping out of the work um, who are not gonna come back to the work because it has been so heavy. And we're losing, like, you know, I have friends who, like, can't function through the day because the loss is so heavy. So we lose people for, like, quote-unquote productivity. We lose people in so many different ways. And, and that kind of loss then impacts in other ways. It also drives the overdose crisis, which we don't talk about. Like, how does your partner carry on in life when you die? It's, it's really rough. my life's story to my good friends that have come and my good friends that have passed this one is for my yes it's for my some of my old friends some of my old friends this one's for my yes it's for my some of my To hang out together down Pound Fawn Road at the old coffee house. The coffee house is gone now. Here comes Subaman, here comes COVID. We had a good thing going. There was a whole bunch of brethren. Here comes Killer Josh, here comes Trinidad. Oh, they both died a bang bang I feel so sad that they're gone There was Venus 
Though he was small, he had big guts So you know that no one could touch us No one could touch us It was a place of refuge for the adult In those days we spoke about real roots We were proud of our culture So proud of our culture In the 70s not many of us With warrior hearts we had to be real tough Though the numbers was against us Babylon couldn't bend us This one's for my Yes, it's for my Some of my old friends Some of my old friends This one's for my Yes, it's for my Some of my old friends Some of my old friends Big Earl playing Slam a double six down Joey had a real frown and Tonka always played the town Reasoning session Always an obsession Cause every youth know them idle And even the one them we idle You see, we learn from grandma a country Bring over sea to the big city So we always chat with variety Keen observers of society with all that man would know better To follow truth and search a creator Some listened to Sedusa And some fell in love with white powder This one's for my Yes, it's for my Some of my old friends Some of my old friends This one's for my Yes, it's for The very best of us That's why Babylon them Turned him into dust Where is Stone Age? We used to read off the same page I heard that they deported you back I hope that you were living on the right path I saw your brother when I went to Vancouver Golden bread, our hands at last We had a few tears and laughs It's so hard for a teenager To come from Trinidad or Jamaica Trying to fit in We had to learn a brand new rhythm But our ancestors showed us real courage It's time to step from violence to knowledge So the memories won't be in vain So many years we felt that With me, we made each other who we are. Though some are who look on what less, you know the rest are with on superstar. This one's for my yes, it's for my some of my old friends, some of my old friends. This one's for my yes, it's for my some of my. and I'm going to be reading a poem that I wrote called Grief. A Continuum The indefinite undulating softly beneath me. Floating quietly on its surface, I am pulled into its tide, fiercely and without warning. Allowing the pull Diving deeply into its power, the gasps of air soften. Eyes closed, 
my mouth just above the break, the line, the gateway. A reminder I am not drowning in its sea. Calmly, untangled from the invisible web below, I resurface. Present, floating quietly on its surface, I stay. The tides of grief below me, with me, moving me forward, no longer sinking down. Floating calmly on its surface, calmly I stay. Hey, Gare. Hey, Bear, how's it going? Welcome to Gare Bears. I think it's time we tell folks about our big... Father's Day sale. You know it, even bigger than the Remembrance Day sale we had last week. You know it. It's huge. Look How at huge? this way. Oh, you want to <laughs> save big on a car? Used, new, I don't care. You come down, you buy a car this week. We're talking 5% off the top, first 15 months. After that, 2.9% on your financing. Oh, that's not all. No. If you take less than a thousand per month on your DPI, add it straight up to your refinancing payments, I'll take off an additional 13.2% off your down payment. As long as you promise, and I mean promise, to come back and give at least $200 towards the purchase of your new car, which is valuable within the next 25 years. If you use it at Gare Bear in the next 25 years, and we're going to be around, aren't we, Bear? Oh, you know it, Gare. <laughs> we're going to be here to the end of the world. <laughs> we're going to every <laughs> You come on down, check it out, I'll give you that deal. Or, you know what, flat out, we'll just call it 100 bucks off any car on the lot. Your choice, Gare Bear, Marino, Lambino, Gambino, Ford. Tonawana's number one choice. Hey, Ma.